As we all know, in the 20th century, the French arts was dominated by Impressionism in both the visual arts and music. In music specifically, the most well-known composers were Claude Debussy and Maurice Ravel. Of course, as Impressionist artists, they wrote pieces about water, with Ravel's Je d'eau and Debussy's Reflet dans l'eau. Today, I'm going to be doing a comparison between these two pieces and how they're performed according to the composer's thoughts and through French pianists like Marguerite Long, Plato Perlemutier, and others. Let's start off by talking about each composer's thoughts and interpretations on how to play their music. So first, let's do a quick compositional overview of these pieces. Debussy's Reflet dans l'eau was written in 1905 and is the first piece of Book 1 of Images. Here, Debussy uses sonata rondo form with themes A and themes B. It is also one of Debussy's most characteristic pieces, as he uses parallel fifths in a pentatonic scale, as well as shimmering right-hand figurations above a whole tone scale. Moving on to Je Do, Ravel wrote this piece in 1901 dedicated to his teacher, Gabriel Fare, and on most editions above the piece quotes Henri de Regnier's Cité de Eau, River God laughing as the water tickles him. This piece, in a way, is homage to Liszt, as in his piece, The Fountains of Villa d'Este, where he also inscribed, But the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up into eternal life, from the Gospel of John. Ravel uses sonata form with novel uses of harmony, Litzian figurations, crystalline multi-fingered passage work, high register dissonance, and tritone cadences. At the time of Jodeau, Ravel was heavily inspired by both WC and Liszt. When asked about how to play Jodeau, he jokingly said, Why? Like Liszt, of course. Clearly, Ravel was being self-deprecating, attempting to deflect criticism away from his piece. But however, it is clear that the piece is written in a way to be played as a romanticist, with the ability to take liberties in your playing. Specifically in Jodeau, Ravel isn't always clear on his musical markings, especially in the beginning. Watch how Yvonne Lefebvre explains it. Alors j'ai même dit à Ravel, mais pourquoi avez-vous mis des liaisons Ce sont des liaisons musicales, mais ce sont pas des liaisons pour le legato, pour le jeu du piano. Vous comprenez Ça, ça, c'est que ça va être comme si on faisait. Je vous signale que si on fait ça, vous faut faire le sol avec la main gauche. Comparatively. Debussy's ideas of interpretation were far more strict than Ravel. Ricardo Vignet, who premiered many works of both Ravel and Debussy, stated, In the evening, the third Durand concert in the Salle Erard, at which I played the first set of Debussy's image, it was such a success that I had to play an encore. I chose La Soirée dans Grenade, which I hadn't played since the first Durand concert a fortnight ago. I wasn't very happy about it especially since I knew Debussy was there in a box, and he never finds this piece played as he wants it. Marguerite Long, who also studied with Debussy, stated, Debussy has left us all the indications possible for the executant of his work. He regarded this with the utmost care, and at times was almost fierce about it. However, sometimes Debussy could change his opinion on how a piece was played. George Copeland, who also studied with Debussy, stated that he wouldn't force his interpretation on him. After playing the last measures of Reflet dans l'eau, Debussy, in an exchange, said, It's funny, that's not the way I feel about it. To which Copeland replied, Then I will interpret them as you intended. But Debussy was quick to affirm Copeland's interpretation, meaning that there was some leeway in Debussy's musical opinion. In Marguerite Long's At the Piano with Debussy, she describes the differences between the two pieces. Ravel had always advised one to play his jeu d'eau in the manner of Liszt. His modesty and his artistic sense of mimicry held him captive to the object of his expression. The arpeggios of the keyboard burst forth, flash and fall back again like a mist of water disguising their source. Contrasting with the descriptive, we find here an example of almost Ravelian abstractus that calls for an objective interpretation. Debussy knew nothing of this rather lofty attitude. His prodigious love of nature plunged him into that life-giving element, water. Not a reflection nor a current in it, not a caress nor treacherous movement escaped him. Watch how Yvonne Lefebvre describes Debussy's Dépasser le Niche. 
Cette œuvre-là, c'est comme les chantons militis, est un peu particulière. Je crois qu'il y a malgré tout quelque chose de lui-même. Mais enfin, les pas sur la neige, qu'est-ce que ça veut dire ben, ces, ces pas sur la neige lui suggèrent un souvenir. Pour moi, il faut le jouer en souvenir. Vous comprenez Les pas sur la neige lui rappellent peut-être quelqu'un qui est parti. Euh, qui a laissé des pas, euh, euh, n'est-ce pas Et euh, il y a toujours, chez Debussy, c'est pourquoi il ne faut pas jouer. Il faut jouer avec une grande intensité, mais au-dessous. C'est-à-dire que ça ne peut pas être comme chez, de, chez Beethoven, le maximum de l'intensité expressive, mais d'une intensité intérieure qui est en somme euh, filtrée, transposée par un écran. With Debussy's piece, it is much more distorted and different than its physical image, while in Ravel's piece, it almost depicts a real fountain. The next important thing to discuss is the idea of touch. In terms of touch, Debussy and Ravel share the same idea of what E. Robert Schmitz, author of The Piano Works at Debussy, calls the slapping touch, or what Marguerite Long calls the oblique touch. Maurice Dumenil, author of How to Play Debussy, states that instead of directly attacking the key from above, the key is depressed from a diagonal angle, indirectly attacking the key, easing into the sound. Looking at it from a more mechanical aspect, having the finger indirectly attacked means that more surface area of the finger is involved in the depressing of the key, meaning that less pressure is applied to the key at the moment of impact. Here's an example. Here, let's watch Helene Grimaud demonstrate it. More specifically, in Reflet, Dumenil, after playing for Debussy, says, The remarks dealing with Reflet dans l'eau were illuminating. From the first, the chord background ought to be subdued, played with laterally moving fingers, drowned in pedal once more. I do not hear the bells, Debussy commented. I gave more tone, but it was not of the proper quality. Keep your left hand hanging loosely from your wrist, then let it drop and let the tip of your third finger play those notes, he said. This bell touch, of course, directly translates into the opening motive of Reflet in the A flat, F, E flat of the first theme. To achieve it, we use the same idea of the slapping motion, where the hand is close to the key to get a supple pressing motion. And also, the force applied to the key will also depend on the size of your bell. And in this case, we started a pianissimo. Let's hear Monique Koss play this. For Jodo, almost the same concept is applied. Plato Prelimuté states that one should play with the light hand, with the fingers close to the key. However, Ravel himself gives two contrasting statements on how to play the first beginning slurred passage. In his exchange with Yvonne Le Fabu, he states that the slurs are not there for the legato, but for the musical line, it should be played non-legato, while Prelimuté states that Ravel wanted her to play the beginning, smoothly and legato. Listen to the two different versions and compare for yourself.
In Debussy's pieces, pedaling is rarely ever written out for performers. However, the idea of blurring harmonies together with the pedal seems often to be a contentious topic between performers. According to Dumanil, Debussy only ever wanted to have a slight overlap between harmonies and not achieve a full blur, leaving that only for special effects. In the case of Rufflet, we come across at measure 90, where Debussy asks for pedal throughout the measure. In general, pedal points are used in both themes to the bass note in a long harmonic stroke, which required the usage of half pedaling and flutter pedaling, as full pedaling with three voices can cause unnecessary blurring. Michelangeli gives a great visual example of the pedaling in this piece. In Judo, we can approach pedaling in almost the same way. Ravel also uses long harmonic pedals, especially in the low bass A section. In the polyrhythmic section, half pedaling and flutter pedaling are also very useful for bringing out the hazy atmosphere without blurring the melody too much. Lefebvre explains the flutter pedal in a very interesting way. Et, et la pédale est toujours soulevée par le, par le, le talon. Ça aussi, il faut savoir. Votre pédale, il faut pas. On ne peut jamais retirer la pédale comme ça. Avec Debussy, avec Ravel, nous avons une autre manière qui est une, une manière à vibrato. Il faut laisser le bout du pied en rapport avec le, la, la, la pédale. Il faut soulever. Vous comprenez oui. Bien que comme ça que l'on peut avoir les basses qui tiennent, par exemple, et, et les, les hauts qui sont, qui sont libérés. For special effects, Ravel wanted the high passages to be blurred, giving the impression of vibrations in the air rather than individual notes. This would be appropriate for the final passage to maintain a hazy right hand while letting the left hand sing through. Here's Lefebvre playing this section. The high double note passage also allows for sustained use of pedal, as it creates a buildup of color. Alfred Courtauld gives a great idea of the pedal usage in this section. In the aspect of rhythm, W.C. always talked about the idea of the flowing rhythm, stating, Rhythms cannot be contained within bars. It is nonsense to speak of simple and composed time. There should be an interminable flow of them both, without seeking to bury the rhythmic patterns. The flow of rhythm means that interpretations are different from ones of romantic pieces, where rubatos aren't stressed on individual notes, but stressed over entire measures. In Rufflet, as Dumanil states, one can start slowly, get slightly faster, and ease up again towards the end. With Ravel, a greater rhythmic freedom is given to the performer, especially in Jado. The grace note figurations are to be played almost out of time, in between the two bars. At measure 48, where the Litz-like cadenza occurs, romantic style rubato can be used to stress the arrival on beat 1. Of course, this rubato can vary, so here are some different interpretations of this measure. <laughs> Thank you.
there you have it. This is just a general look at the music of Ravel and Debussy, and I hope you learn a bit about French music. Thanks for watching, and I'll link the sources down below. See ya!